Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I'm Alexa Allen and here we talk about true crimes, conspiracies, and mysteries. Before we get started, I want to thank everyone who is currently subscribed to my channel. I have recently reached a thousand followers, which is huge for me. I'm really excited about it and it wouldn't be possible without you guys, so thank you. Now, if you're new here, I try to cover cases that provide commentary on our justice system as well as cases that speak to how society treats minorities and women. I also like to cover cases that are unsolved or cases that are not as well known. Occasionally I will throw in paranormal cases and sometimes there's crossovers. So if all of that interests you, I suggest hitting that subscribe button because you will definitely enjoy what's to come this season. Now let's get right into today's case. This is a case that I had not heard of before until I discovered a book called Goat Castle by Karen Cox. And if you wanna know more on this story, I would definitely recommend reading her book. So Jenny Merrill was born in August of 1863 to Iris Phillips Merrill and Jane Surgeon Merrill. Both of Jenny's parents came from some of the nation's most prominent planter families. They were very well off. Jenny's mother actually died in childbirth, so unfortunately there's not much else to say about her. Jenny's father was a planter. He owned a plantation and he actually had 600 slaves. But despite being a slave owner and living in Natchez, Mississippi, Jenny's father actually sided with the North during the Civil War. I would have to guess something was in it for Iris. Maybe he knew that the South was going to lose this battle. He had a good friend in the North, General Grant, who fought for the Union Army, and he kept his family safe during the battles. And this allyship helped save the family's wealth. But after the war, Jenny and her father were sort of shunned by their neighbors and other Southerners. They weren't a fan of how Iris took sides with the North, obviously. Eventually, they would move North to New York, and after that... They would actually move overseas to Belgium and Iris became a U.S. ambassador. Jenny's father died in 1879 when she was only 16 years old and she was left with a very large inheritance. She never got married, but she received frequent love letters from her second cousin, Duncan Minor, back in Natchez, Mississippi. And she would eventually move back to Natchez in her mid-30s. Jenny and Duncan were said to have nightly visits to each other's estates. And according to the letters, Jenny didn't really reciprocate Duncan's feelings. But after Jenny's death, there were some rumors that they actually were married in secret but that remains unclear. Jenny continued to have a hand in the family business, owning and operating several farms, and she purchased a home named Glenbury in 1904. And now I'm gonna introduce some other characters. In 1916, Jenny got some new neighbors that moved in next door that went by the names of Dick Dana and Octavia Dockery. Dick's family was from Old Southern Money, and he inherited this mansion next door to Jenny called Glenwood. They were not a couple. Dick was said to have frequent breaks with reality. I don't know what he would have been diagnosed with in today's modern medicine, but he definitely had an intellectual disability and needed a caregiver, which was Octavia Dockery. Octavia was the daughter of a Confederate general who fell on hard times during the war. So pretty much what she had to rely on for finances was livestock. She kept livestock on the land that surrounded Dick Dana's property. Now this property, was not in good shape. There was no electricity, no running water, the roof was leaking, it was sort of falling apart, and the two of them couldn't even afford the property taxes, so they essentially became squatters on the property. And their livestock would frequently head over to Jenny's property and destroy her land, and they got into several legal battles. It's safe to say they were not good neighbors. Now I'm going to introduce you to another character. We have Lawrence Williams, born nearby Natchez, Mississippi in the 1870s. He was a black man living in the Jim Crow South, and like many other black folks at the time, he headed north in which is now known as the Great Migration. Lawrence ended up in Chicago. He got a steady job, got married, had kids, had a nice family. But unfortunately, when the Great Depression hit, he lost everything and had to head back to Natchez, Mississippi. Lawrence went by different aliases. When he moved to Chicago, he was known as George Pearls. Um, it's unclear why. I don't know if he just wanted to start anew or if he was into crime, which we'll get to. But he ended up back in Natchez, Mississippi, going by Lawrence once again. Now, in the summer of 1932, Lawrence meets a young woman named Emily Burns. 
Emily is a 37-year-old black woman living in Natchez, Mississippi. She goes by sister to her friends and family, and she volunteers at the local Baptist church and works as a seamstress. Lawrence introduces himself to Emily as Lawrence Pinky Williams. Now, Emily was said to be kind of sweet on Lawrence, so after they got talking, she was like, hey, you're new in town, you don't have a place to stay, my mother and I run this boarding house, why don't you rent a room from us? And Lawrence happily agreed. Now, where these two stories connect is that Lawrence actually had a history with Duncan Minor, Duncan, who is the cousin of Jenny that has a love interest in her. Back when he was young, Lawrence used to work for Duncan, so he thought it might be easy to just start working for him again. No, they already had that rapport, and he knew that Duncan had money, so it might be an easy way to get a quick job. Duncan actually declined. He said that Lawrence should have never left the South, and this is basically what he gets for ignoring the old ways of the South. Lawrence also tries to ask Jenny if he can get work from her, and she declines as well. So this leads Lawrence next door to Dick and Octavia's, and they definitely can't pay him. But they have another idea. Dick and Octavia suggest that they all band together and rob Jenny next door. So the following is based off of Emily Burns' testimony after her arrest. Lawrence heads back to the boarding house. He asks Emily, hey, do you want to go for a walk with me? And Emily is just taken by Lawrence and she says, yes, of course I'll go for a walk with you. So the two of them are, you know, walking along, chit-chatting, and Lawrence brings up to Emily that he's actually going to rob Jenny Merrill with these two folks. Emily wants nothing to do with it. And she objects, but Lawrence pulls a gun on her and says, we're going over there right now. So they go meet up with Dick and Octavia and the four of them head over to Jenny's house. Lawrence is the one that goes in the house to start the robbery while the others stay on the lookout. Now, Jenny is an old Southern woman that lives by herself. Of course, she's gonna have a gun. Shots are fired from both sides and a struggle ensues. Jenny is shot twice, once in the neck and once in the chest and unfortunately ends up losing her life. Jenny is then carried out of the house, it's unclear by who, and is thrown into the brush about 100 yards away from the house. At this point, Lawrence, Octavia, and Dick ransack the house for money while Emily stands watch. And no money is found because Jenny didn't keep money in the house. So that was all for nothing. Dick and Octavia head back home and Lawrence and Emily go back to the boarding house. When they get back to the boarding house, Lawrence burns all his clothes and arranges a ride out of town which Emily believes is to go back north. And Lawrence leaves all his belongings at the boarding house. So later on, Duncan comes around the house for one of his nightly visits to Jenny. When he arrives, some of the help says that they heard gunshots fired. Duncan enters the home and sees that the place has been ransacked and he sees blood everywhere, but he cannot find Jenny. It wasn't until the sun came up the next morning that they found her in the brush and Duncan was left with everything in Jenny's will. Now the sheriff at the time was a man named Clarence Roberts. He starts the investigation, but he's actually very familiar with the feuding between these two houses as the cops were frequently called. He immediately heads next door to talk to Octavia and Dick because in his mind, they're already suspects. The sheriff knocks on the door and before he can say anything, Dick Dana says, I know nothing of the murder. Now remember, Dick has an intellectual disability, so he has no idea that he's implicating himself in the murder. It's quite possible that Octavia tried coaching him, and this is the phrase she told him to say to the police. Dick and Octavia are both arrested and taken to the county jail for questioning. Their fingerprints were later found at Jenny's house, so they were charged with murder. Lawrence's involvement is soon revealed, and a detective from Louisiana, Maurice O'Neill, comes to assist in the investigation. Maurice, he starts looking around the black community, asking questions about Lawrence. And he is soon led to Emily's boarding house where all of Lawrence's belongings are found. So Emily and her mother are arrested. Now get this, three days after the murder, Lawrence is actually shot six times and killed in a separate incident by an officer. The officer that shot him thought that this was the man that was wanted in Natchez for the murder. So he decided to be the judge and jury. This is the Deep South during the Jim Crow era. This officer calls the Natchez Police Department and says, hey, I think I've got your guy. But the paperwork that Lawrence was carrying actually said his name was George Pearls. So the Natchez police were like, nope, that's not our guy. Thanks though, have a nice day. 
Meanwhile, that detective from New Orleans is searching Emily's boarding house, and he finds paperwork belonging to a man that goes by the name George Pearls. And this detective, he puts two and two together, and he says, maybe that was the guy. So now the police don't have anyone to arrest for this murder, and they really pressure Emily to confess to her involvement in the murder of Jenny Merrill. Emily obviously isn't going to confess to a crime she didn't commit, but eventually an officer placed a bullwhip on the table and told Emily that she had 30 minutes to confess. So she did. Emily is given no rights to an attorney until a week before her trial. Lawrence is convicted posthumously and Emily is charged with accessory to murder. And her attorney actually does make an effort to defend her. He tries to claim insanity, but that doesn't hold up in trial. He also wanted the fingerprint evidence talked about at the trial, the fact that Octavia and Dick's fingerprints were found in the house, but that expert that found those fingerprints was allegedly nowhere to be found during the trial. So there was absolutely no discussion of the fingerprint evidence at the trial. And a jury of 12 white men, of course, found Emily guilty and sentenced her to life in prison. So as for Octavia and Dick, the story really shifted on who was to blame once they found out Lawrence's involvement. They had a black man to pin this on. They didn't really need to worry about Dick and Octavia any longer. There's sympathy building for Octavia and Dick. The two of them are photographed and interviewed in jail, and this becomes national news. The media portrayed it as this poor, intellectually disabled man and this poor woman that had to take care of him, and they have nothing to their name. They're living in squalor amongst animals in this once grand estate. So the home is dubbed as Goat Castle. Dick Dana is dubbed the wild man, and Octavia is dubbed as goat woman. And their home becomes sort of a tourist attraction. People travel from near and far to come see what a mess this house actually is. One day, nearly a thousand people came to visit the estate while Dick and Octavia were still in jail. And these people were going through their home and just taking stuff. And when the two were released from prison, they decided to capitalize on all this attention they were getting and started charging admission to their house. They would charge 25 cents to enter the grounds and another 25 cents to actually enter the house. Dick would provide musical entertainment on the piano and Octavia would tell stories of the old South. Not only would they continue to have tourists over the next decade, they would travel throughout Mississippi and Louisiana, billed as the wild man and goat woman of Goat Castle. So they did like theater stage performances telling their story. Now we're in the middle of the Great Depression. Things like freak shows are very popular at this time. People really love that cheap entertainment and seeing people that were in more dire situations than they were to make them feel a little bit better about themselves. Now we have reality TV. Now Sheriff Roberts, he still doesn't like the idea that Dick and Octavia essentially got away with murder and he continues to build a case around them. And Octavia actually has the audacity to try and sue the sheriff for false arrest. The sheriff responds by arresting Octavia once again and they actually go to trial, but it results in a mistrial. And there's never a follow-up. They were never held accountable for their crime. Emily Burns spends eight years in the Mississippi Penitentiary, and this place is essentially a plantation. The prisoners are all made to do manual labor. This was a terrible place. In December of 1940, the governor of Mississippi actually visits the prison and ends up pardoning Emily Burns, and she's released and moves back to Natchez, Mississippi. She learned to sew while she was in prison and would end up becoming a seamstress upon her release, and she ended up getting remarried and spent her free time volunteering for the Baptist church. Jenny's home has since been repurchased and restored, and Goat Castle no longer stands. That story was a wild ride. I can only imagine what Emily went through knowing that she didn't do it and was forced at gunpoint to even be present for this crime, and then had to do all that time in prison. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Let me know what you guys think about this case in the comments down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.